we are short staffed. We're, we're trying to find ways to conduct these investigations and not use that as an excuse. The last phone call was the night that she supposedly went missing. I don't know, the priority for Native American women. I, I hate to believe that, but it's just not there. It's the system. The system is broken and, and we're a part of that system. The Forgotten, a true crime Arizona podcast. Where was Laverda Sorrell? Call the police, send somebody to her house right now, something's wrong. Valina knew there was no time to waste, yet she didn't feel law enforcement felt the same way. There was no urgency in their response. It was, you know, well, give it a couple of days, and then, you know, if she's not home in a couple of days, and then we'll, we'll look into it even more. By the time I got back, it had been a couple of days. There was still no reaction from the police. It was super frustrating, um, beyond words. Those five days turned into weeks, turned into months, turned into years. And so the panic that you have just develops into something more. The frustration from the Sorrell family was palpable. They're emotionally exhausted by how Laverda's case has unraveled. And even after more than two decades, it doesn't feel they have any more answers or details than they had just days after she vanished. The frustration from Laverda's family isn't an isolated story. It's one we've repeatedly heard from Native families. To even begin to unravel how this crisis has exploded, I knew we had to start on the reservation itself, where these investigations begin. Put it on this side. Okay. My photographer Shane Egan and I hit the road, heading to Window Rock on the Navajo Nation. Sergio was already there, gathering video for our documentary. We would meet up with him to interview the president of the Navajo Nation. Window Rock is about five hours from Phoenix, but feels like a completely different world. We ate lunch at a McDonald's near the president's offices. It was one of the only restaurants there. We parked near the executive offices and walked outside. It's a beautiful area. Benches and trees line the area below the actual Window Rock. There are small mountains and rock formations each direction. Everyone was preparing for a blizzard to roll in the next day, so we barely saw anybody. Shane and I just rolled on his camera, giving each other our raw first thoughts of what we were seeing and feeling. It's crazy actually being here and seeing the reservation for the first time, because I feel like you have these picturesque views, you've got these mountains, you've got these rocks. It's so pretty, and yet, the actual life and the lifestyle here is, it's hard to drive by and see it. Just thinking about the project and, and actually witnessing this in person, it becomes clear why these families are fighting for anything. Attention, focus, resources, I mean, it all makes sense. It's weird driving through and it seems like you're going to the middle of nowhere. Yeah, And then yeah. you just get to this like, picturesque view here and it's almost like a national park right hidden right in the middle of kind of nothing. Kind of right? nothing. And, and, and the fact that Navajo Nation too is like the biggest, one of the biggest reservations in this country and this is the center of it and you, you've got these really cool just beautiful nature views here but it's desolate, it's like a ghost town, there's really nobody around, like this is the center of it all, and and this is what they're working with. I mean, it's, I don't, I don't know, part of me is like, it's kind of, it's kind of sad that this is their reality. They're a sovereign nation, they want to govern themselves, but at the same time. You can see the lack of resources. Yeah, they need help. I mean, point blank, we haven't been here that long and we can already see that. You know, it's an interesting takeaway. You look around you and you think, wow, this is, this is a beautiful state. I mean, we're sitting here just listening to the birds chirping. It's, it's peaceful. 
And yet, so many of these families are dealing with anything but peace. Just, just trying to have somebody listen to their stories. I, I think that goes to the, the fact of why we're even doing this documentary and this investigation in the first place. Daryl Noon, D-A-R-Y-L-N-O-O-N. I'm the Chief of Police for the Navajo Police Department. So this is an interesting interview because we didn't expect to be interviewing you today. Point blank, when I was asking President Nigren about things that have gone wrong with missing and murdered indigenous women and pointing to some issues within the Navajo Nation police and tribal police in general, he said, I'm calling Chief Noon and he's going to come here and address this because there are issues. When I first got here, we were trying to get a hold of it. So I changed you know, the way that I policed and that's what I'm trying to change here. This isn't an easy position for the Navajo Nation police chief to be in. And I was struck right away by how transparent he was with me. When did you take over as chief? January of last year. Chief Noon is very aware there's a problem with how they've been treating cases. Part of me can see how that attitude develops. I asked him to explain why. The Navajo Police Department is a separate department from the criminal investigations, which means, you know, people come to the Navajo PD, they complain to me about case they're not being told, they're not given, being given information, uh, there's a lack of transparency, just those types of complaints on cases that we weren't investigating. It really, uh, it made it difficult. We are short-staffed. We're, we're trying to find ways to conduct these investigations and not use that as an excuse. We have funding for more officers. The problem is hiring officers. We lose a lot of potential applicants and backgrounds. And for this last academy class where we started 17, we had over 100 applicants. So only 17 passed background checks? Yeah, started the academy. Chief Noon says it can be hard to find recruits who don't already have some kind of criminal history. It's situations like this that have a trickle-down effect to where even the bare minimum isn't being done. In our Shiprock district, our jail is closed. So every time an officer makes an arrest, they got to take them to the hospital to get a clearance. Then they've got to travel an hour, an hour and a half away to, to book them into another facility and then come back. So they make an arrest, they're, they're out of pocket for four to five hours. So do you think they're not making arrests when they should because of those conditions? I, 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 I'd have to say that that happens. You know, and, and I, I, I hate to admit that, but you know, this is the current state of, of where we're at right now. It's the system. The system is broken and, and we're a part of that system. You know, we're doing what we can to fix, you know, what, how we do business, but we need everybody else to do the same. And it's just trying to, to, to change the culture, the mentality, and you know, go to these calls and have a little empathy. Try to put yourselves in, in their shoes. How do you get your officers to to care about some of these cases? The families that we've interviewed have said there's just been this kind of blatant, non-committal attitude from tribal police that they've worked with, that, that they don't really matter, that, you know, we don't have the time, we don't have the resources, sorry. How do you flip that switch in your officers? Well, I think that uh, we things are looking better for us because now the Navajo Police Department, when you look at our the makeup of our officers, you know, the majority of them are going to be younger officers with under five years of experience. So we're really trying to hammer this home in the academy setting. Navajo Nation is a sovereign nation. While sovereignty is a source of pride, President Boo Nigren knows they need outside help. Right now, the issue is, is that just to take a phone call, uh, to take a phone call for a normal phone call, let's say it's a burglary or speeding or just the normal uh, things that do happen, there's barely enough resources for that. How much extra funding do you need to even get up to a level that would feel acceptable or adequate to be able to properly investigate these kind of cases? I think if, I don't know the exact number, but if I were to assume it would be in the millions. The way to get more funding is simple. Prove how desperate the problem has become. At least, 
you'd think it was that simple. We'll partner with a research university, comb through existing data, backtrace it back to tribal enrollment numbers, and create a database of data that doesn't exist in any searchable format. That's Jennifer Germain. She's a former state representative who led the first ever study committee on MMIW in Arizona. The thing is, they couldn't prove how dire the MMIW problem was because the data on it didn't exist. She is the reason why that changed. The goal was to try and organize data to figure out where to even begin to fix this. How did you do that, though, with the lack of, of numbers or reporting that's out there to begin with? A lot of it was um, a team of graduate students combed through police reports and combed through the narratives of the police reports to find the data that wasn't in searchable fields. So we looked at a 40-year time block of Indigenous women and girls. And what we found was that people were being murdered from infant all the way into their 90s. And what we found is that over that 40 year period, there was a steady increase in murder rates. And we were only able to get the numbers that were reported. What has been reported is significantly less than what is out there. A lot of it goes back to um, the jurisdiction issues. Uh, what we found was that law enforcement agencies were basically playing hot potato, not my problem. Why? They have their turfs. And what we really need is our agencies to communicate and cooperate and form intergovernmental agreements and properly hand off cases. Some states are required to report missing persons to a database called NamUs. It's a huge resource for missing Indigenous women, and men too, for that matter. Arizona is not required to do that. New York City has it as a city ordinance. It's the same law. I believe Illinois has it. Where after 30 days of being missing, if you're an adult, they input all of your data into these databases. That seems like a given. Yeah. And that Arizona is just straight up not cutting it. Yeah. Other states are doing it. Yet we have probably one of the biggest, if not the largest population of indigenous people in this state. How are we not a part of this? Yeah, it's frustrating. It is, it is completely frustrating. Do you feel the biggest barrier right now is the fact that it's not getting the vote it needs to be required? Yeah. How do you change the minds of lawmakers that don't see that as a priority? You know, it, a lot of it comes down to personal conversations and a lot of it comes down to making sure that they see these people as real people and that these families as real families. For so long, nobody has listened. One of the big things that helped was we had a whole bunch of Native women who just came down here and they camped out in the stairwells and told every lawmaker their story. Did that create some change? That created change. Powerful, yes, but it really shouldn't have to take that. For way too long, we have had leadership in Arizona that didn't really care enough about this issue. But there, I understand why people don't trust uh, uh, government sometimes, especially uh, on this issue, because frankly, government has failed them. Government has failed them over the last uh, decade or two. Arizona Attorney General Chris Mays is already working on getting extra funding to our reservations for training and resources. But often a case is escalated not to the state level, but to the federal level. And then Mays doesn't have a whole lot of say. That's what happened in Laverta Sorrell's case, but not right away. Akil Davis, AKIL, DAVIS, Special Agent in Charge, FBI Phoenix. So the FBI has special jurisdiction um, for, for major crimes occurring on, on Indian Reservation. We have 22 reservations here in the state, and the FBI has responsibility for homicides, crimes against children, uh, and major assaults. Do you guys pick up missing people cases or missing persons cases on the reservation if there's no body yet? So it depends on um, what we know about. Uh, the circumstances surrounding why someone would have gone missing, or if we come up, um, if, a, if a body is reported, um, how that how that came to be. Going missing isn't necessarily a crime because adults can can leave at their at their own free will. So um, that's why I can't stress enough. It really depends on the circumstances of how this person went missing. 
It's been 21 years since Laverta Sorrell was last seen. The circumstances of her disappearance were enough for the FBI to eventually classify it as a homicide case. But that isn't without its challenges. Them telling us that they cannot do anything because they don't have a body is their biggest challenge right now in our case. Laverta's sister, Belina, hoped the FBI's involvement would move things along quicker and lead to more answers. But she says it hasn't made the difference they hoped it would. The problem with the FBI was that in that area, there's only one FBI agent. And they're located, there's like a substation located in Gallup, New Mexico. That one FBI investigator oversees a lot of the Navajo reservation and it's pretty vast and the FBI investigators that started then when she disappeared would move on they would get relocated to another site so we're actually on our fifth FBI investigator and we really don't know what they are doing we really don't know what they're uncovering or what they're investigating we're we're just told that we need to be patient and that let, let us do our job. I don't know, the priority for Native American women, I, I hate to believe that, but it's just not there for the FBI. I asked the FBI special agent about those frustrations. What's your response to those families who say, I can't even get a hold of the FBI agent on this case? Yeah, so we, we have a duty agent that's here 24 seven, so they can always get a hold of an FBI agent. Um, and then we can coordinate getting any updates should they be available. But I cannot stress enough that the FBI does not frequently provide updates to family members because we want to protect the integrity of the investigation. So because of that, we do keep a lot of stuff close hold. Is the worry that sharing updates, let's just say every few months, that that would leak information out to somebody you wouldn't want it to get to? Exactly, exactly that. Um, we would not want to share information even, even with the family and then have that information be put on social media or the normal media or, or anything uh, of the such. So you try to keep things more under wrap even if that's not the family's wishes? That's correct. In order to, because of that ultimate goal I said, is successful prosecution. In the end. It isn't just Laverta Sorrell's case the FBI has been working on. There is another. The last phone call was the night that she supposedly went missing. It's a case that we've been watching unfold in real time as we investigate further. I can remember her last words of, I'll call you gals later. Jamie Yazzie's family, they've had to go boots on the ground. It made me so mad. I was like, I knew it. I knew it. That's what I said. Coming up on episode three of The Forgotten. It's been hard to die three years, I guess, not knowing that she's out there and uh, just hoping that, that she will come back home. I know everybody else was saying that he did shoot her. So I told her, tell me what happened. Tell me everything. True Crime Arizona, the podcast, is hosted by me, Brianna Whitney, and produced by Sergio Hernandez. It's a production of Arizona's Family, 3TV, CBS5, and azfamily.com in Phoenix, Arizona. This is True Crime Arizona, an Arizona's Family Originals podcast.